Hey everyone, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our weekly lecture. This one is on the Czech Benoni, and I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Sapu Bob. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor a lecture, email my wife Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com, and you give them, she'll tell you how much a lecture costs, and you get to decide the topic, unless it's a little crazy, then we'll make it a little less crazy. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the sponsor wrote a note about, um, you know, he knows that I play the Czech Benoni regularly, and he didn't see a lot of other grandmasters doing that, so he wanted to know the ideas and such. And it turns out one grandmaster who plays it often uh, in uh, Blitz and Bullet is Levon Aronian. And in fact, I played Levon once. We played a casual Blitz game uh, in front of the St. Louis Chess Club on one of the outside tables. And he played the Czech Benoni against me, which I also play, which obviously he doesn't know because he... And um, I ended up sacking all my pieces and then resigning. So I didn't have any pieces left. If it was Bug House, maybe I would have done okay. So I want to look at um, four different games today with four different players playing the black side. First one is Anandaronian. I'd already seen this game, like doing preparation for the opening. This was in Zurich in a rapid tournament in 2014. So let's have a look at the game. Um, every game this lecture is going to start with the following moves, uh, and then e5. So they'll all start from here. And typically what happens is, <clears throat> and when I say typically, I mean every game. <laughs> uh, when the center gets closed, when white plays e4, black wants to play f5 or, or b5 and white wants to play f4 or b4. So you're, you're gonna see those moves a lot. And sometimes one side will play them both. And occasionally uh, both sides play them both the same game. So we'll see f5, f4, b5, and b4. That's rare, but that happens. And otherwise there's not much to do because the center is blocked up. Now, if you're an engine person, and you're like, uh, excuse me, the engine says white's much better. I don't want to play this with black. If you play any kind of King's Indian, Benoni, Czech Benoni, the engine's like white because white spawns on D5 and white has a space advantage. And that doesn't mean that you're going to have poor results when you play it yourself. And I mean, these games are with good players. These are all good players. The games I'm going to show you and person's interested in the Czech Benoni for black, which I am as well. So black's going to do well these games. Okay, so most people play knight c3, d6, and e4. I could have made this the starting position because this is almost always what happens after black plays e5. Okay, now, depending on who you talk to and who's playing it, black can play different ways now. So Sometimes black plays knight d7, knight f8, knight g6. That's what I like to do. Sometimes black plays g6, bishop g7, castles. And it looks like a king's Indian where blacks played c5 really early. And sometimes black plays knight a6, knight c7, and tries to play for b5. Um, and they're all, they're all okay. You can do whatever you want. Okay, Levon played knight bd7. That's not a move that I play. Uh, I play bishop e7 first, but I guess uh, Aronian could fianchetto his king bishop if he wants. Maybe depending on what move white makes, he'll play g6 or bishop e7. Depending on whether white plays g3 or f3 or knight f3 or knight e2, then he, then he might play g6 instead of bishop e7. Okay. So he plays knight f3, Anand, bishop e7. <clears throat> and I had this position with white against Anand in a game 30. Anand used to play this way with black also when he was a teenager, early 20s, but just in blitz and rapid. He didn't play it in slow chess. 
Okay, and I and this position I've had with black many times. I just played bishop e7 first. Okay, g3. He castled. Um, knight f8 to g6, which I usually do, probably isn't a good idea against g3 because my knight can't go anywhere. So he castles. Bishop d3. It's unusual for white to play bishop d3 and g3. You're not going to see that very often. Um, either they play bishop d3 or they play g3 and then they play bishop g2. I've never seen somebody play g3 and bishop d3. But okay. And Aronian played knight h5. And typically, uh, knight h5 is risky because the knight's not defended. So a lot of times in these positions, another person other than Aronian who's played this often, but it was 40 years ago, was Yasser Sarawan. And Yasser likes to play knight e8, g6, knight g7, and f5. Uh, so he fianchettos his knight. Knight h5 has the similar idea. We're going to play g6 and f5, but the knight's more active on h5 than it is on, on e8. So um, now this trick doesn't work where you take this threatening the knight because your bishop on d3 isn't sufficiently defended. So you can't do that. Okay, so a non played queen e2, and that way Aronian doesn't know which way Anon's going to castle. a6, he's like, well, if you castle queen side, I'm going to play b5. Bishop d2, looks like he might castle queen side. g6, black wants to play f5, so g6 makes sense. And Anon played king d1. And I've actually seen king d1 and king d2 in this opening because the center is closed. So the king is very safe on c2. Now, I wouldn't do that. I would, I would castle if I was queenside if I was white. But the king is really safe on c2. Maybe he wants his rook here in case he plays on the queenside later. Still, it's an unusual move. Okay, king h8. He's getting his king in the corner where it's, where it's safer. Um, I wouldn't play king h8, but maybe I should. Okay, h3, knight f6. So it looks like he's giving himself the g8 square for his knight, and he has the e8 square for his knight, and he's making sure that white doesn't do anything on the king's side at the moment. King c2, bishop d7. So once a non play king d1 going to c2, Black knew he was going to try to play b5 later, so he got his knight out of the way so his bishop could control b5. Now, in this position, Anand is playing like in a strangulation method. He has more space with white, and he's not doing any kind of break. He's just saying, I have more space, so my position is better, and eventually I'll, I'll break somewhere. Okay, Anand played a4. He's just making sure Ronian can't do anything. Queen c8, that threatens the pawn on h3. Now white has to make a decision. He chose g4. Knight g7. Often I play knight f4 and sack a pawn in these positions, but well, my knight's on f6. Whoops. So that might allow e5 to come too quickly. This is probably good for white. White's crashing through in the center. So he played knight g7. So you can see black is very passive and Aronian is waiting for Anand to overextend. Okay, knight h2. That defends the g-pawn so white can play h4 at some point or white can remaneuver his knight to e3 or g3. He doesn't like his knight on f3 because that stops white from playing f4. Okay, knight g8. That makes sense to me. Makes sense he played king h8. Now he wants to play f5 at some point. Black has a lot of pieces defending f5. His rook, his knight, his bishop, his queen, his g6 pawn. Okay, I always, I always knew Aronian was a g6. Okay, f4. Finally, somebody did something, and I told you to watch out for f4, f5, b4, and b5. Those, those are the breaks. Okay, and you always want to take on f4. If white plays f5, that's really bad for black, and I actually allowed that, a similar position against Walter Brown, and I lost. 
And Gregory Kaidana said you always have to take that pawn on f4. You can't let him play f5. So, okay, so Arodian knows that. They trade it. And now f6, never play f6. Very passive move. But he's stopping white from playing e5. Knight, G, knight f1, here comes the knight to a better square. Rook f7, knight e3, queen f8. So he's ready to play f5 at any moment, but he's just waiting for white to do something and make white's position worse. Now, throughout the game, if you look with an engine, it says white's better, white's better, white's better, white's better, white's better. Then later in the game, Anand makes a couple of suspicious moves according to the engine, and it's equal, and then things get better for black. But here, black is just waiting. h4, bishop d8. Bishop might be good on a5. Queen h2, threatening the d-pawn. Bishop c7, h5. Here comes Aronian. I mean Anand. Their, their, their names are so close. Anand, Aronian. g5, h6. Okay, so Anand wants to open up the h-file. So knight e8, bishop g3. So this looks terrible for black because all of black's pieces are on the first and second rank, but it's very hard for white to do anything. Like, if white's going to break, it's going to play b4 or e5. That looks very difficult to do. And black is going to improve his position by moving his knights a lot. So you got knight e7, knight uh, g6, controlling the e5 square, and eventually this knight might go to c7 and will play b5. So black has ideas also. Knight e7, okay, knight f5, knight g6, all the stuff that I said. a5, trying to make sure black never does something on the queen side. Knight e5, bishop goes back defending the g-pawn, takes the knight, takes back. Now the knight has the beautiful e4 square. Queen e7, bishop e1. Queen d8, black's trying to win this pawn, white's trying to defend it. Knight e4, defending his pawn. So you see the knights in the center are excellent, and white has a big space advantage all over the board. But then knight on e5 is pretty good. Okay, so Aronian plays rook e7, getting his rook on the open file. Queen g2, defending the knight. And then b6. And this position, Anand made his first mistake. The engine still likes white and says white should take on b6. Okay, and white played bishop c3. And now Aronian did something that from my past in chess, I know as the Jinjahashvili trick. When Jinji wants to play a pawn move that allows on passant, and he doesn't want you to take on passant, he just goes one square, making it look like he wants you to take it. Then when you don't take it, then he plays b5. It could be anywhere on the board, and that's what Aronian did. Aronian thought, if I play b5, he'll take on Passant, so I'll play b6. That way Anand thinks I want him to take it. Then I'll play b5. Now white can't take on Passant because it's illegal. Okay, so now black is doing okay. Takes, takes, takes. So white wins the b-pawn. And then black wins the a-pawn, because the a, a6 pawn isn't here anymore. So we just traded pawns. Bishop c6. The engine still likes white. Rook a7. Bishop takes e5. Engine likes that. Rook takes e5. Rook a4. Now Anand starts going astray. Probably he's in time trouble, because this is a rapid game. So all of a sudden... You could see how white could be overextended. White's king doesn't have anything in front of it. There's no pawns on c3 or d3 or b3. Knight c7. Rook a1, attacking the bishop. Knight a6. This is a little tactical trick. If you take the bishop, I check, and I unleash the latent potential of my rook. Although now it's actualized potential. If you had more than an 8th grade education, you would get that joke. Okay, so... Uh, he played knight d2, Anand did, knight b4 check, he sacked the exchange, always sacked the exchange, the, the engine agrees, 
takes. You can't take with the bishop because your, your rook's hanging. So pawn takes, knight c4, b3 check. And in this position, Anand made the losing move. And I would guess in a rapid game, very few grandmasters would play the right move here. Maybe in a slow game and they thought for 10 minutes. Okay, Anand unfortunately opened up his king more and he didn't last very long. According to the engine, even though Anand has made a couple of mistakes the last few moves, king d3 is still equal. And if you don't believe me, you're like, king d3 is never good, then I refer you to the game played a week or two ago in Tata Steel, depending on when this video comes out on YouTube. Uh, the game uh, Gukesh versus Faruja. Was it Gukesh? Faruja was black. I think it was Gukesh. And he played king d3 in the opening where the king was much worse and it was the right move. And he won. Okay, so Anand blundered and played king takes b3. Now he's in a lot of trouble because his king's open. Rook e7. Notice the rook is attacked. So he moved his rook to like the only safe square. I don't... I think, well, I guess you could play rook e1. I didn't see rook e1. But rook e7 is the best move. Black wants to keep rooks on the board because white's king is so terrible. Queen g3 attacking the d6 pawn. Queen b8 check, exclam. <clears throat> and unfortunately, when Anand played queen g3, he undefended the e2 square. He was interested in this d6 pawn. But after queen b8 check, the king can go to the A file, which allows, well, king A4 allows queen B4 mate. But then it allows bishop E1 check winning your queen. So the only move that makes any sense is king C2, then rook E2 check, and black is just totally crushing white. So in this position, Anand resigned. I think um, if you play king C2 and I check, if you play king D3, this wins your queen with a skewer. And if you go to the back rank, this would win your rook in the corner. That's me in the corner. And this queen sacrifice doesn't help very much because all of white's pawns are very weak and black only has one weak pawn. I mean, he could have played this, but after something like, I mean, I could probably win the knight, but I could play queen d4 and you can't take because queen d6, queen e5 check wins the knight. Then this pawn, all these pawns are going to fall. So... Okay, so he, instead of all that, after queen b8 check, Anand resigned. So Anand didn't do very much wrong that game, but the game was very closed. They were maneuvering around. They both played well. The engine's like, I like white. Then all of a sudden, the tables turned, which shows that Anand thought they were unturned tables. Okay, and then referencing Rick and Morty, of course. Confusing the audience. Okay, let's go to the next game. All these games are completely different in the way they look. Okay, now this game, the guy with white has a lot of names. Usually, when your opponent has a lot of names, they're better at chess than you. But in this instance, it's not true. So black is Fabiano Caruana, and white is not Magnus Carlsen. So that means Fabiano's better. He's playing Cristiano Gomez de Souza. Okay, the guy's got a lot of names, but his rating's only 2018. And this was on a Title Tuesday Blitz tournament two years ago. And again, a lot of super GMs and GMs, if you find games in this opening, they're usually going to be Blitz and, and Rapid. Because in Blitz and Rapid, if the engine says white has a big advantage, it's like slow and steady and maneuvering. And guys can't do that in Blitz and Rapid. So all the tactical ideas work in Black's favor when things happen. So if you're paired down 700 points, like Caruana is, his goal is to get you out of theory and make you play your own moves. And that's what this opening is good for. White, White's got to play his own moves pretty quickly. Nobody's studying this for White. They're studying it for Black. And uh, Caruana played like me, but worse. So he played castles, which I don't do. And then when they castle... They usually play knight e8 and g6 and knight g7. He played knight bd7, 
which I would play this with black, but I wouldn't castle. I would play knight f8, knight g6, then castle. And then he wanted to play knight f8, so Fabi played rook e8. It's a strange way to play knight f8 and knight g6, because you could have done it before you castled. But I guess Fabi wasn't studying this a lot. He was just getting a position his opponent didn't know. Then he would outplay them. And boy, did he outplay them. Okay, h3. I don't, I don't see the purpose of that. Knight f8. Knight e1. Sometimes white plays knight e1 to d3, and then he's ready for b4 or f4. Knight g6. Knight d3. H6. H6 is a common move because black wants to play knight h7 and bishop g5 and trade off his bad bishop. I do that all the time. Bishop e3, knight h7. Basically, Fabi's playing the way I play this opening but with the tempo down because he played rook e8. And it, rook's actually better on f8. So this is a worse position than Fabi should get from this opening, but it's still really interesting. Rook c1, I don't like rook c1. If white wants to play b4, the rook belongs on b1. Bishop g5, queen d2, bishop d7, completing development. a3, white wants to play b4. b6, Fabi solidifies his queen side, b4, and queen f6. And again, without using an engine, I would assume the engine likes white, because white has more space. But since black is trading off his bad bishop and black has access to these squares in white's camp, black has a good chances of an attack, especially since this is a blitz game. And the engine telling you you're better doesn't help you play this position because typically <clears throat> the p engines move around a lot doing nothing and just saying, I'm better, I have more space. Okay, so he played bishop to g5. That's definitely a mistake. That doesn't make any sense to me. You're helping black get his pieces towards your king. So that's, I don't like that move for, for white. Bishop g4, white wants to trade off his bad bishop. Now white's king side is a little iffy. Knight f4. And man, I wouldn't want to have white here because I don't like anything white can do. I don't like knight takes f4 because after e takes f4, I'm threatening f3. I'm threatening the pawn. My queen has this nice diagonal. And the only way to save your pawn and stop f3 is to play f3. And that looks really risky. You're giving up all the dark squares. So that is what happened. And he played f3. All right. I don't like that, but I don't like leaving the black knight on f4 either. Okay. He played rook c8. Now Fabi's threatening to take and take on c4. So knight b5. That defends the c pawn. Rook e7, that defends the a pawn that was attacked. And I mean, white just can't do anything here. Th this is definitely better for black because white's king is so much uh, weaker than black's king. Black's king is the safest king ever. White's king is never going to be safe because there's so many squares open to the king. And white has no breakthroughs. White, white, didn't pl white played b4, but he didn't break through anywhere. He took... Rook takes. Now the C pawn on C4 is weak. Queen D4 wants to trade queens. Fabi says, no, thank you. I'm going to checkmate you. We're not going to trade queens. White wins a pawn. Man, that's, that's not, that, uh, that lets black attack pretty quickly. H5, put it in H. Here comes the attack. Takes. Knight H3 check. And obviously white didn't see knight H3 check when he played g takes h5, but he didn't want to allow h takes g4, and the king's getting opened up. I would assume knight c6 is the best move, if I was assuming something. But he took knight h3 check, played king h2. Uh, if, he, if he takes the knight, uh, black could play queen h4, Oh, I'm sorry. Black just plays rook g5 check and wins the queen. That's what happens when I don't use an engine. I can't see a beginner's tactic. Okay, so white saw that even in a blitz game. And white played king h2, queen h4. Now black's threatening everything. He took, which is a mistake. Queen g3 check. 
then he resigned because if he plays king h1, rook h5, and here comes rook h3. And you might ask me, Grandmaster Feingold, sir, uh, is that common that black gets to mate white like that in this opening? And when you see game number four, I'll be like, yeah, that's, that's what happens. So when I win games in this opening, because sometimes I lose or draw, then often they look like this. I broke through on the king's side, and my king's really safe, and white didn't do anything. And this is a great opening for black, especially when you're a much stronger player. It's very difficult to play both sides, and there's not a lot of theory. You know, you play somebody lower rated than you, they're not going to say, oh, this is like Ivanchuk Kasparov. No, it's not. It's not like anything. It's just like a made-up opening, and there's very few Super GM games, and usually their blitz are rapid, and they're all different. So white has to play their own moves very early in the opening, and that's, that's not good for a low-rated player. They want to play their 20 moves of prep they did in the Nightwarf. So too bad. Okay, next game, Serana, very strong Grandmaster, is playing uh, Faruja, who's a stronger Grandmaster. Serana's FIDE rating is 2656, so he's no joke. And this is in the Pro Chess League. This was Rapid 2020. And looks, looks the same, right? Okay. And every game started this way. And Faruja played g6 instead of bishop e7. He must also be a g6. Okay, he played g6 like a g6. Okay, bishop e2, bishop g7, bishop g5. I don't like that move. White's not going to give up his dark squared bishop, so I don't see the point of that move. A6, he's waiting for white to castle queen side. So white plays h4, doesn't commit his king yet. h5, knight f3, queen a5. Faruja's really ready for white to castle queen side. So Serana castles king side. Okay, knight g4. White's played h4, so he gave up the g4 square. Knight h2, kicking the knight out. f6, never play f6. Now I don't know what white's supposed to do here. I mean, white, white doesn't want the bishop to be captured, and white doesn't want bishop e3 and the bishop's captured. That's white's good bishop. So I, I don't like this bishop g5, queen d2 for white. Okay, so he took the knight. Oh, give me the knight. Then he took back. Now again, we're threatening the bishop. There's only one safe square, but that hangs h4. So now black is a pawn ahead. g3. Rook goes back, and white gets his pawn back. And now, Faruja is so good at chess, he castled kingside. Now, I can't castle kingside, because I'm not as good as Faruja. So that's, that's the rest of the game I can't show you. No, he can't move his, he can't castle because his rook moved. So he played queen c7, b3, does nothing, f5, attacking the bishop, and when you take on f5, which he didn't do, then knight f6 attacks the bishop, and I get my pawn back. So he played bishop f3 instead. f4, that's a common pawn sacrifice in the Czech Benoni, is f5, f4, sacking a pawn. If you don't believe me, wait until the next game. Then you'll be like, hey, you did it again. How do you, how do, you do that? Okay, so they traded. Now, by sacrificing a pawn, black activates his bishop, and more importantly, black gets the e5 square. And white does not have the e4 square. White can't play knight e4, but black can play knight e5. And he did. Now, if I had white, I would be terrified, well, I'd be terrified of knight f3 check, of like queen e7, queen h4. And then mate is inevitable. So he played bishop g2, queen f7, also good. Knight e2, defending the bishop again. g5, black sacrifices everything to get at white's king. If you play bishop takes, I assume queen h5 wins, and I assume knight f3 check wins. Looks like knight g3 is forced, because I'm threatening checkmate and checkmate. And then bishop h3, and then I, then I give up. Luckily, I'm black, so I don't have to give up, but I give up for white. 
On behalf of white, I give up. So he played bishop g3, knight f3 check, and, and that's it. I mean, Serrano's a really strong player, but he got beat really badly. And after bishop h2, trying is the first step to failure. Ferugia has many moves that win, so I'm not sure why white's playing on. For example, what do you do on queen h3? I don't know. Okay, but he played bishop e5, which is more accurate. Because he's threatening, bishop takes h2 mate. The bishop can't move because of all the checkmates on h1. So now, now it's time to resign. And he did. If he plays the move, knight, he resigned, right? Yeah. If he plays knight g3, once again, I can play bishop h3. Why didn't he play bishop h3 here? Oh, queen takes g5. Yeah, bishop h3 now, I can defend mate. I'll still take black, but... I didn't get mated. But yeah, after bishop e5, I can't defend mate because knight g3 blocks the queen from going to g2. So, so, I mean, white just got totally crushed on the king's side, and black never moved these three pieces. And it looks like he didn't move this piece, but he did. I like the way he played queen a5, and then he mated him on the king's side. Okay, so there's a lot of maneuvering in this opening. There's pawn sacrifices to open up the position, and then somebody gets an attack. Okay, last but not least is one of my favorite games. And I played this game, I was at a hotel in Michigan, and I was playing in the Pro Chess League for St. Louis. And this is the year that we won the Pro Chess League. It was uh, Wesley So on board one, Vara Kobian on board two, I was board three, and we had a 2100 on board four. I know his name, I just can't think of it. I'll think of it at some point, I'll just yell it out randomly. It might be in two or three lectures. Anyway, we won the Pro Chess League. In the finals, we beat Magnus's team, and one of the players on Magnus' team cheated against me. And he acknowledged that he did that several years later. So I don't feel so bad about losing to that guy now, because... He crushed me, but there's a reason why he crushed me. Okay, and this is my game with Shakri Armamajarov. This is the best player I've ever beaten in a, a game that was, like, official. I've beaten Anand when we play for fun, but, I mean, nobody cares about that. One time before the World Championship match in New York, Anand was visiting his family in Michigan, and I went over his place. He's like, let's play some chess with no clock. And I was like, all right. And I got one and a half out of five. I had a win, a draw, and three losses. So that was good because I should get zero. So, yeah. I'm sure he didn't care about the games at all. He's just passing time. Okay. So this is the best player I've beaten where it actually mattered. And it wasn't a blitz game. This is a rapid game. It was in the pro chess league. It's a team event. Your team's trying to beat the other team. And obviously nobody on my team expects me with black to do anything against Mamajarov. And there's video on this. They did live coverage of the Pro Chess League. It was Yermolinsky and David Proust. And they were watching the end of my game. And they were like, well, Feingold's going to win. What? What, 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 what? what is this? And nobody accused me of cheating because, uh, well, I don't cheat. But the engine never likes my game. The engine's like, black's worse, black's worse, terrible. And I'm playing like me, so that, that's how I play. And at some point, which happens in a lot of Czech Benoni's, things turn around. White doesn't play accurately. There's little time on the clock and so forth. Okay, so this is against Shakri Armamajarov in 2017. Okay, and this is the way that I play the Czech Benoni. I play bishop e7, knight d7, and I move my knight around. He played knight g2. I played h5. Asa Hoffman who's a FIDE master you've never heard of. He lives in New York City, still alive, amazing. He's been alive forever. Uh, in fact, he showed me his yearbook signed by Jesus. That's how old he is. And he said when they play knight e2, you should play h5 because you want to play h4 and stop knight g3 and stuff. Okay, so he played h3, Mama Jarov did. I played h4, so I'm stopping knight g3. I don't know which way Mama Jarov is going to castle. 
and he played a3. I played king f8. You remember the first game of the lecture when Anand played king d1 to c2. I actually want my rook on the h file. I might attack with it later. So I play king f8 because my king is very safe on f8 and g8. And I don't want, I want my rook to stay here. Now, if you told me, like, before this game that I was going to win, I would assume I played boring and I was worse and I was getting outplayed and he blundered. That's a good way to beat a better player is they blunder. And then they can't escape from a blunder. You win a knight or a rook, then I'm going to beat Mamajarov. But somehow, uh, when the position was crazy, I outplayed him and I, I, I beat him by beating him, which was weird. Because usually when I beat higher rated players, I can show you the move they made, which lost the game for them. They just made a one move blunder and I like won a queen. In fact, I have done that. I beat Viktor Mikulevsky. He was crushing me the whole game. Then he hung his queen in a slow game. Then he didn't resign. He played on like 15 more moves. That's the respect that they have for me. Okay, so he played b4, b6. So we got, we got one of the four moves in, b4. He took, I took back, and he played rook b1. So he's not going to castle queenside. Okay, I played knight h5. I want to get to f4 and so forth. He castled, and I played king g8. King is better on g8, safer. Rook b3, he wants to attack on the queen side. Bishop f6. You might say, why is your bishop better on f6? Well, I'm going to play knight f4 and sacrifice a pawn, then my pawn's not going to be on e5, so my bishop's better on f6. Play rook b1, bishop d7, knight b5, bishop back to c8. Notice he's attacking my pawn, but he's blocking his rooks. So I'm like, well, if you're going to block your rooks, fine. King h2. Now it's not a pawn sack when I play knight f4 because his king's on h2. So if it goes take, 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 bishop e5 wins his queen. I put in like four too many takes. Okay, he took with the bishop. I took with the knight. He took and I took. And what I was saying earlier was if he takes, I play bishop e5. So he can't take. So he played bishop e2. I played f3, which the engine doesn't like. It says never play f3. The engine just wants me to play bishop e5 and says I'm okay. But I wanted to sacrifice a pawn and open up his king. I don't want to go down like no punk. I want to like, you know, try to beat him. Okay, he took. I played bishop e5 check. Rook h6. That's why I kept my rook on the h file. Now my rook can start attacking him. Bishop g4. Trying to get rid of his, my two bishops. Get rid of his bad bishop. Take, take. Rook g6. Obviously threatening his pawn. And he played f4. Now again, I can't go down like no punk. I can't play bishop f6, bishop e7. Right? If I do this, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Okay, now all my pieces are the worst. My rook's trapped and I'm down a pawn, etc. Okay, that wasn't my plan when I played rook g6. My plan was to play a6. And now, if he takes my bishop, I take his knight, and the position's nonsensical. However, if he plays knight c3, I play bishop d4 check, and then I take on g4. That's unacceptable for white. So he had to take my bishop, and I took his knight, and this is the craziest position ever. And when it's the craziest position ever, and it's rapid or blitz, you want to bet on the guy who has the safer king. And now it looks like I castled, but my king is very safe. I've activated my rook by playing a, b, and rook g4 is a threat. And taking on e5 is a threat. So white's up a pawn, but white's king is more exposed than mine. And again, the engine likes white, but... Okay, so he took on b5. I think the engine doesn't like that. I played c4, because I want to play queen b6 check and get at his, get at his king. Played rook b4. The engine says rook c3 is better. Rook b4 gives away this pawn, which activates my rook. And he probably thought that didn't matter because he'd queen his b pawn. But after rook c3, the engine still likes white. 
Okay, and I played rook takes g4. He played queen e3, which is a mistake, stopping queen b6 check. Rook g3. I mean, queen e3 is a really bad move. Queen f4. I took, he took, and I played queen b6 check. And in this position, he made a mistake and played king h1. He should play king h2. And now I made the best move of the game. This move gives me a winning advantage, and it's not so obvious. Because you might think, I could take this, I could take this, my queen could go to f2, the queen could go to g6. Lots of attractive looking moves. Okay, but I played queen e3 because I was attracted by one move, h3. If I play h3, that's not good for his king. But I can't play h3 because he takes my rook. Okay, so I played queen e3, which is the best move. Now I want to play h3. And now he realized, hmm, Ben wants to play h3. That's not good. So he played king h2, and that's why he should have played king h2 the previous move. He shouldn't have played king h1. He just lost the tempo. Now if I play h3, he takes my rook, and I lose. Okay, now I triple up on the bubble up. Rook takes a3. Okay, and now... If this is a slow game, he can resign, but it's a rapid game. He played rook takes c4, and I have instant mate here, which I didn't see. I have a really easy mate. And I did see a mate, but it was longer and more complicated. But I didn't see the simple one. The simple one is rook h3, only legal move. Queen f2, which I didn't see. I saw rook h3, I didn't see queen f2. And then rook h3 mate. Well, okay, he has to go here, but... So I, I would have won the game immediately, but I played more spectacularly because I didn't see queen f2. I played rook takes g2 check, and I knew that one because I calculated it out to a win. He takes, and now I have my queen and my rook attacking. Now it's time to get my pawn involved. Okay, so he has three legal moves. These three. Okay, king h1 and king h2 lose for the same reason. I play queen g2 mate. And if he plays king h1, I play queen f3, and then queen g2 mate. So therefore, he played king f1, and I played queen f3, and I calculated if he goes here, I made him. Good calculation. Uh, and here he resigned. If he plays king e1, I was intending rook e3 check. He has one legal move. Now, you can decide on your own if you want to play queen f2, rook e1 mate, or rook e2, queen f1 mate. I think I was going to play rook e2, queen f1 mate. I think that was my intention. But instead he resigned. But when I played rook takes g2, I saw that that was mate. I saw that I'm winning. So it's not really worse than rook h3. It just takes an extra move or two. And then after queen f3 check, he resigned. So that's the best player I've beaten in a rapid or slow game. Mama Jarov was ranked fifth in the world. Um, after this game... Uh, in the last round of the match, Mama Jarov played Wesley So, who was on our team, and our team already won the match with a round to go. In the last round, we could have lost 4-0, and we still would have won the match. So me and my opponent agreed to a draw in like five moves, because the match didn't matter. And then we got to watch Mama Jarov play Wesley So. And Mama Jarov won one of the most amazing games I've seen. So if you can, look for Mama Jarov having... Uh, I forgot what color he was. I think he was white, but I forgot. Against Wesley So. And it was an amazing game. There was all kinds of sacrifices and pawns promoting and kings running around. And eventually Mama Jarov won. It was fun watching that game and not playing my own game and getting you know nerve-wracking time. Anyway, that's the Czech Benoni. That's a lot of the ideas for Black, where Black won some games against very strong competition. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. I hope you like and subscribe. And if you want to have a lecture sponsored, contact my wife. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com. And once again, I want to thank our sponsor, Sapu Bob. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye.